who moved the floor over to, to Knut Blind um, for the following um, panel. And, um, and there I would also like to see maybe from the technician the, this, the first the panel slide so that people can see who is on the, on the panel. If you could please move that up. Okay, thank you very much. Knut, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Nicholas. Um, and thanks for this interesting kind of discussion and the, the very interesting um, uh, also contribution by the panelists. Um, please maybe move on to the slide about the uh, second panel, please. Oops, that's one. Yeah, here we are. Um, I mean, it's really just, just in time, I hope. We are not not yet so hungry. The the, the initial idea was to uh, was to kind of separate the, the two panels first, talk, talking about essentiality test and then about uh, licensing practices. But uh, when you look at the discussion in the chat and the, and the the Q and A's, this is this is mixed. Nevertheless, um, we we'd like to to hear some uh, kind of experiences about. Uh, yeah, what are the, 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 the challenges? What are the opportunities regarding licensing uh, practices in the in the in the future? And also whether here maybe also some some institutional solutions which have been discussed regarding essential allergy test might be appropriate. And uh, in the panel we have um, five people. First, uh, my colleague Stephanie Miller from the Fraunhofer IS, known for for the MP3 uh, um, solutions. Uh, then. Fabian Hoffmann from the Bundesgerichtshof, uh, Steve Vecchelli from, um, from Audi, um, and then uh, we have uh, Mattia Fogliaccio from Siswell, and finally uh, Georg Kreutz from uh, Huawei. And in order to maybe have at the end still a little bit uh, um, the option to discuss, I uh, kind of introduce a little bit kind of a, a signal for the, for the time, for the timing, uh, that means after four minutes, you get the, 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 the yellow stick and after five minutes, the, the, the pink stick, just to signal that when the five minutes are over. And now, uh, Stephanie, are you, are you here? Ah, here. Can, here she, here can she is. you hear me and see me? Yes. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to contribute to this uh, conference. Um, it's a topic that is very close to the heart of those participating as well as panelists, um, as as participants. Um, while my distinguished speakers before me had touched upon uh, various elements of the discussion, um, I, I would like to take a, a, a step back and uh, come back to what Kerstin Jornas stated earlier this morning as the starting point. I believe she said the starting point is always the business case. So when we look at the business case of licensing in the patent arena and certainly also in the arena of standard essential patents, the business case does usually start with a negotiation and not a litigation or a dispute. It's a bit like um, when, you, when you first start dating, it's not about divorce, it's rather about uh, falling in love and getting married. So um, I, it's a bit surprising for me that the focus now seems to be solely or at least mainly on disputes because the true context, as I said, is um, commercial negotiations uh, and the increased importance of all parties entering into good faith negotiations, especially now during the... Um, pandemic situation that we're all facing and um, the measures of lockdown that are experienced around the globe. So good faith is really the one quality and the cornerstone of international trade that can propel us forward. Um, we've also heard from uh, Professor Maya Beck that there is no one size fits all approach. It's rather looking at the individual business case, the individual transaction. Now that made me reflect upon the business model of Fraunhofer being a large application oriented research organization. And in research, much like in a uh, licensing space, the daily business is really about individual setups, individual project or business setups, and always 
with the notion of having to deal with a remaining degree of uncertainty with a certain comfort for the parties involved in the business. Now, how can this certain comfort in dealing with remaining uncertainty be achieved? It can be achieved by creating an element of trust between the parties that are negotiating the project. It has to do with healthy business ethics. It has to do with respecting the rule of law and respecting the business partner, their rights and opportunities and obligations. And far and foremost, fairness. So fairness and transparency in really talking about the project. What are you trying to achieve with each other? And I believe the same is true for negotiations when it is was Beat Weibel who um, introduced that into the discussion that court cases around licensing of standard essential patents on friend terms and conditions around the globe, no matter what jurisdiction, are mostly about the conduct of the parties during the negotiation phase when trying to arrive at a friend license, not about the essentiality of the patents. So it sounds a bit like, <laughs> excuse me for this, this uh, referring to an everyday example, it's, it's a bit like we might see mis misbehaving, which is the conduct element, rather than really defective facts that the negotiation is about. So that makes me come to wonder whether putting additional efforts into creating a and again, excuse me for the term, creating a pseudo transparency, uh, hoping that it could help restore the willingness of um, the users of technology by creating what Kerstin Jorna called a trust broker effect might be leading us on a slippery slope. Why am I saying that? I mentioned pseudo transparency. As Monica Magnuson mentioned, the declaration of a patent to an SDO's database is to ensure that the standard can be published and made available to the public. So it is not an essentiality declaration statement. And by thinking of conducting essentiality assessment tests, there is an implied risk that it may be um, not complete or it may, may lead to a result that would not hold in case tested by a court, which would then lead to the question, you know, what if, if it were um, not upheld by a court later and damage would have occurred in the meantime, who would pick up the cost? Not even speaking of the cost for the essentiality check. So a pseudo transparency. And again, it ties back to research, much like licensing of standard essential patents. There is no 100% certainty. There is no 100% control. It just does not exist by the mere nature. Um, so I guess we have to be careful if we want to see innovation going forward, helping us to establish uh, a healthy digital economy and recovering from uh, COVID, post-COVID, hopefully when uh, um, the... Um, the uh, vaccines are available. We have to be careful to not put additional burdens on the innovation system, which is under stress already, by imposing additional um, burdens on, on any one of the stakeholders by further regulating. We have a risk of devaluing IP, which um, may be one element also in the discussion of uh, the renovation of the German uh, IP system, the German patent code. And um, we might also not be seeing an increase, the, 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 the increase we're hoping for in the willingness of implementers. So we might further burden the system, but we may not see the desired result, which is certainty, control, and an increased willingness on the implementer side. And yet looking at it from the research perspective, 
there is a lot of funded research in the national and in the EU space and certainly also in other parts of the world. So there's a lot of funds, mostly from taxpayer sources, being uh, attributed to research and also with the expectation that some of those research results be by some form of standardization to allow for innovation to happen and innovation really to the benefit of industry, the wider public and society. And if we were to tamper with the commercialization regime and scheme, which has helped bring innovation forward over the past five, six, seven decades very successfully, we might actually really destroy the exact cornerstone and stepping stone that we need to build on post COVID. And that's, that's something which is really, I believe of great concern because we, we do see government funding going into research programs, but what if we then cut short the commercializ commercialization path for the standardized technologies? And by um, making participation in standardization possibly more costly by um, putting in extra steps that need to be met by the um, technology owners, there is also an implied risk that we may lose some quite robust standardization partners from academia that have contributed um, great patents to successful standards in the past. And um, they might also be very needed for the innovation efforts going forward to help the EU uh, implement their um, new industrial strategy, the new Green Deal strategy, and that tied with the digital. And um, we would like to see all stakeholders that are active in R&D, as well as in implementation, to be able to participate and bring their best technologies, their best um, efforts to the table. And um, we still think that the best way that can be done is by good faith negotiations of partners that respect each other, that do their due diligence to understand what the business case is about, and then um, use their best efforts to come to a fair license. And it was warming my heart when Professor Maya Beck uh, mentioned earlier that he was very hopeful that that could be done. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Stephanie, for kind of making a point from a kind of uh, yeah, research and uh, organizations perspective. Um, we now move on to uh, uh, Fabian Hoffmann from the Bundesgerichtshof. Yes. Are you here? Okay, I, 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 I had to unmute my phone. Thank you very much. Now you, you are, oops. You are muted. Oh, what's happening? Okay. Okay, now the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I, I had problems with uh, unmuting myself. Thank you very much, Knut, for having the opportunity to speak to the this great audience. Now, being not only a judge, but also a member of the SAP expert group on licensing of standards and central patents from the European Commission, let me start with some general remarks uh, about the work in our group. Our goal was not to produce an action plan that could be implemented uh, right away. If this had been our ambition, uh, we would have had to search for the least common denominator and our report would be much smaller. Instead, our report is meant to be a contribution to the debate. It addresses a lot of problems that are highly relevant today, but also those that might only become relevant in the future. Actually, with regard to the problems raised in our discussion today, in the SCP expert group, we have addressed most of these problems in our report too. Like for instance, the questions of essentiality checks, the licensing and the value chain, the determination of friend rates, the formation of pools and the installation of independent expert commissions. We have tried to present solutions to all these problems, developing 36 major proposals. Now you will see that not all, not all proposals are supported by a majority of the group. Some are only supported by half and some even only by a minority of the group. Nevertheless, we present them all because we want to show that there are solutions to all these problems 
and the, the, that these solutions should be at least be considered. In our report, we address the pros and cons for each proposal. However, if the reader does not agree with the proposal, he or she should feel encouraged to come up with a better solution. And should there be no solution, no better solution at hand, he or she might reconsider the solution given in our report and try to improve it. Therefore, not all proposals from our group are recommended for an immediate implementation, but they are all recommended for consideration and to fuel the debate. Now today, in the short time we have, I would like to present you two of these proposals, which might expedite the licensing negotiation a little bit. The first proposal relates to licensors or pools with essentiality checked patents who have complete standard licensing terms and conditions, including a precise royalty rate for all licensees or a defined group of licensees. These terms and conditions would only have to be accepted by a licensee in order to close a licensing agreement. Now, if not only the licensor, but also the relevant SDO make these licensing terms publicly available together with claim shards of the checked SEPs, then according to the proposal, the first three steps of the Huawei versus CTE framework could be skipped. In this case, it would be up to a willing licensee to make a first step by either accepting the, offer licensing, the, the offered licensing agreement or making a counter offer or submitting arguments against the validity or the essentiality of the SEPs. However, if the implementer remains silent after introducing his product to the market, he should be considered a holding out licensee and be obliged to pay a higher royalty for the time until a license, a license agreement is concluded. The second proposal refers to the situation if the licensor has not published a standard licensing agreement through the SEO, or if the terms of such an agreement do not suit the product that the implementer is introducing to the market. In this case, According to the proposal, the implementer should be obliged to register the use of the standard in one of the SDO's databases as soon as his standard compliant product is introduced to the market. The database would only be visible to SEP holders with checked SEPs. According to the proposal, if the implementer fails to register the use of the standard, he or she should have to pay a higher royalty as I've stated in regard to the first proposal. So now if you want to know more about these and all the other proposals from our, the group of experts for the licensing of SEPs, then please take a look at our upcoming report. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you Fabian for, for giving us already kind of a sneak preview into your upcoming report. Um, and uh, we might come back to, to this uh, later. Um, now, number three, third speaker is Steve. Steve from, from Audi, that means the implementer side. Steve Faraci. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Steve Faraci. Um, Knut, okay. can you hear me? Yes. All right. Okay, perfect. So thanks for the invitation and um, being able to participate in this prestigious panels um, and this event. Thanks for organizing. I wanted to quickly remark that um, the previous panels have already touched on uh, most of the really pressing issues. Um, I want to structure my um, presentation in uh, two parts. First, I want to go uh, quickly through uh, with some remarks through the recent developments um, politically and on courts, and then um, dive into some remarks for the questions which have been uh, posed by the organization. Um, so the first point would be the IP action plan of the European Commission. Um, so it's generally to be welcomed that the Commission um, has a determination to create a stable framework for fair negotiations and to promote a constructive dialogue between stakeholders. In particular, as Castagnona has mentioned, um, her willingness to um, act as a trust broker and uh, potentially provide a forum for broader discussions. 
Um, however, um, whether or not this in the end leads to regulation should be very carefully considered. And um, these um, commercial, as these are commercial negotiations, um, in the end between parties. I think this is a point which um, Stephanie has already touched upon. Um, the second point would be uh, the pilot study on essentiality checks. We heard um, the, the panel before, um, and also the 5G landscape study. We welcome um, the provision of publicly accessible um, essentiality checks and also um, and or claim charts. Um, however, it needs to be discussed how to incorporate such an instrument um, into the existing system. Um, I tend to agree with Monica um, that we should look more closely into this implementation questions. Um, what, also a question is what could be an incentive um, to motivate stakeholders um, to make use of such essentiality checks? There are costs involved, um, as Monica has mentioned already. So might it be possible, for example, to, to create a, a requirement um, to conduct such essentiality checks um, to start litigation, for example? This is a question to be answered. I also um, tend to agree with the previous speaker, Beat Weibel, um, on his point that an automatic reduction of litigation will not be um, created by reducing the number of SEPs. So the emphasis there is on automatic. I don't think this is um, necessarily true. Um, the recent um, referral to the ECJ on the regional court of Düsseldorf, um, the questions are important, which have been referred um, in particular on supply chain licenses and a willingness requirement, which uh, my, uh, Professor Maya Becker has already touched upon in the um, federal court of justice decision. However, it re remains to be seen what will come out of this. Um, on the other hand, we have two different uh, regional courts, Mannheim and Munich, which have already decided and touched these issues in recent months. And it will be um, really interesting to see whether or not the ECJ decision um, on this topic will lead to harmonization. Um, the question already asked by Hans Goddard, I think is an important one. It will be very interesting to see what the other courts in Munich and Mannheim, how they will react to the ECJ referral. And now just quickly to um, the two topics I wanted to touch upon um, is the main challenges for SAP licensing. I agree with Peter Maybeck, there should be a level playing field. This is the emphasis. Um, licensing strategies should not distort the market by selective licensing. Um, everyone in the market should be licensed, and this is really important for competitiveness. Um, however, we have a real huge expansion of in the IOSP, IOT space by SMEs and everyone in 5G licensing. So it will be really important. Um, it, they will be overwhelmed, um, in, SAP owners as well as in, um, uh, potential licensees, and there ha has to be uh, some um, provision of um, effective uh, negotiations. Um, this goes a little bit against the remarks of Sir Robin Jacobs, respectfully, and uh, Stephanie on why fix it. I believe there is a reason because in 5G we have a lot of more um, stakeholders involved, more patent owners and more um, potential licensees. Kerstin's question on whether or not to look for a one-size-fits-all solution, I believe we could start with an industry sector solution and then develop this one into a one-size-fits-all solution. So, this, so we welcome to engage in um, negotiations and discussions uh, on broader topics with the European Commission. And just one quick remark on the specific needs and practical operation. It, I, it, it just touches a little bit on Fabian's point. Um, we believe it might make sense, and this might be an idea to um, provide guidance and templates on general friend licensing terms that are not disputed by and there, by any stakeholder and thereby also acceptable to all players in uh, the industry, um, patent owners and um, potential licensees. So this might be something we could um, start off with um, as a basis and then uh, let uh, an ADR, IDR panel, panel um, discuss further. Going a little bit over time. Thank you, Knut. Thank you, Steve, for, for your contributions from kind of a car manufacturer's uh, perspective also. Um, then uh, we move on to, to Matja, um, because we, we have... Thank you, Knut. We have heard a lot about patent pools uh, in, uh, in the first panel, uh, especially already. And therefore, I give you now the floor, Matja. Thank you, Knut. Pleasure to be here, first of all. And um, let me start by uh, addressing one of the elements that are core as to why patent pools are mentioned so many times, probably in the webinar of today. Patent pools are a form of intermediation, not the only one, 
that is really seeking to reduce friction in the market. How do we do this? We do it simply by aggregating many rights from different patent holders for one technology, typically around standards. And that is our job. And that helps in reducing the friction because uh, all those discussions that would be needed to be had bilaterally between each licensee and each licensor can be resolved in a much more efficient way. Now, friction in the market uh, in at least uh, the last couple of years uh, has been, though, even when it comes to patent pools, not sufficiently removed. There has been quite a bit of friction, as a matter of fact. Um, I would like, though, to caution uh, from, you know, uh, really considering patent pools or other forms of intermediations coming short to address uh, all the issues. There is the need of a lot of time and investments in order to make also patent pools successful. Let me make an example that is not actually directed to the world of mobile communication or even Wi-Fi or other uh, communication standards, rather to digital video broadcasting and specifically DVB-T2. We have been managing the DVB-T2 patent pool, which is a regional standard, a European standard, for the better part of 10 years. And uh, for many of these uh, 10 years, actually the level of penetration of the market that we achieved was uh, languishing, was around 10%. But in the last two quarters of 2019 and the first two quarters of 2020, we managed to jump from about 10% to well above 70% market penetration. How did we do that? We have been engaging in a very good discussion with the implementers. We have been trying to address some of the issues. We have been working with our patent owners in order to make available, uh, make available um, what were solutions that were addressing some of the issues that the implementers were seeing. And we succeeded in really having a pool that is now keep on signing up additional licensees. And I am absolutely convinced eventually we'll reach a much higher level of penetration in the market. By the way, we represent 100% of the patents that are essential to that standard in that pool. 100%. I think it's a first, it's a word first, uh, and it is truly extraordinary. But you should be cautioned to think that the success of the pool is necessarily linked to the fact that we represent 100% of the patent stack, because that penetration in 2019, continuing in 2020, occurred before we have been able to reach this number. So that was not the only factor that had an impact. Allow me, though, to turn the attention to another thing that I heard a lot today. I heard a lot of proposals. I like a lot of proposals that uh, address, for example, transparency on terms and conditions of license offering. I have been hearing, for example, proposals to put uh, on websites patent brochures, also for mobile communication patent pools. I've been hearing proposals of making evaluations uh, uh, more widely available and in particular run by neutral parties. And I actually happen to think that every single one of these proposals is extremely well thought through and uh, has a lot of ground. Just one note from my side is that every single one of these proposals is already implemented, at least in our pools. And our pools, I know, at least for some of these, are not the only ones. We do have a patent brochure also for mobile communication licensing programs. I found it a little bit weird, honestly that you know we would be uh, singled out uh, for that whilst we already have that practice uh, absolutely run since years transparency well our agreement uh, is 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 on the website uh, can be seen by everybody evaluations of essentiality run by third parties i mean we always select and pick only very reputable independent third party evaluators to run evaluations of essentiality and I agree, I mean, it, not every single licensing program from, uh, you know, uh, every single licensing party is run with the same level of uh, care and with the same standard. But what I want to signal here is that we need to really be careful in fostering a narrative where those solutions are innovative and they are not implemented yet, because they are. And another thing that I want to signal is that it seems to me that we are landing in a new season in which we are looking at so many proposals on how to improve further the ability to remove friction 
be between implementers and innovators. But one thing that I want to signal is that in as far this season will last, in as far we will keep on putting on the table additional solutions, and we will not look at the tools that we already have available, that in my opinion are plenty sufficient uh, to remove friction, there is going to be always an additional friction put into the market. Why? Because the implementers will say, see, well, we needed all of those things that have been proposed to be implemented. And the innovators will say, well, but this is extremely costly. It's, it's very difficult and so on and so forth. So we need always to be very careful in striving to achieve perfection because we are going to keep on hampering the world of today. Actually, I think to some extent, one of the problems that we need to realize is that price, whichever price it's on the market, is always believed to be excessive. We all would love a 90% discount, 80% discount, possibly 100% discount on stuff. There is nothing as good as a free lunch. But the problem is that that cannot be the reality in order to keep on fostering the world of innovation and to have a solid background, uh, bedrock for, for innovation. I'm already overshooting, so I'll try to wrap up very quickly. And I'll try to make you one last example. The CISVAL versus higher case, and uh, I will not develop as to the details of that because clearly <laughs> much better that could be done uh, by the judge who has been deciding on the case uh, earlier in a separate panel earlier today. But, uh, uh, so I will not develop on what Maya Beck said, but um, what I want to say is that the CISVAL versus higher case is a very good example of this friction. Higher stopped manufacturing mobile phones not selling, manufacturing in any part of the world more than six years ago. This battle lasted six and a half years, costed millions of euros in attorney's fees, surely to both parties. Why investing so much energy in friction that is not resolving anything, in particular for a company that doesn't even manufacture the phones anymore? That is a case really to say, we need to look at where we are investing and what we are doing, because there is something that makes much more sense, sitting at the negotiation table and iron out uh, terms that can be acceptable to both parties. Knut, sorry for overshooting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mattia, for that uh, very interesting kind of uh, last example and also other uh, interesting um, insights from the perspective of uh, patent pool managing organization. And uh, last but not least, now we have uh, Georg Kreutz from Huawei representing one of the uh, uh, big players in, in the field, uh, in 5G uh, in, in particular. Um, now, are you here? Okay. You have your unmute, you have your unmute, you have your unmute yourself, then we can hear you. Thank you, Mr. Knut, yeah. Hi. Uh, for being here. Um, so I would like to just give my personal opinion about uh, what challenges we are expecting for in SAP licensing in the near future, and actually what are the needs uh, to make it easier for the market, let's say. So regarding main challenges for SAP licensing in the future, I would like to start with a change in the SAP owner landscape, having turned to a growing level of misuse of SAPs with the sole intention of IPR monetization, which doesn't mean most users are different than before, but uh, there are more, than, more and more users which differ from the former one. So in the last century, SAP owners had been mainly active in all fields of use of the related connectivity SAPs and had cross-exchange license agreements established with smaller amounts of money moving around. Since some years, more and more SAP owners are selling parts of their portfolio to non-practicing entities, uh, so-called NAPs, in order to gain higher amounts of money paid by their competitors. They still have cross-licensing agreements even with. Additionally, since the millennium, some of those main SAP owners get rid of parts of their business, business and become NEPs in that fields when licensing out, uh, also raising the money they can gain with this. Uh, so the only pain for SAP owners greedy in gaining money out of SAPs are other SAP owners being active in the supply chain of IoT products. And therefore, there's a high effort spent now 
to make sure that they can pick their licensees and can avoid having to discuss with such um, other SAP owners which have some historical knowledge about the real value of SAPs and the license situation. Um, so we hope that this will be discussed or maybe decided by the European Court of Justice, even if the Professor Meyer Beck is doubting about this, but we still hope for the, for the courts. And uh, in the past, we learned it's to a certain extent always useful to rely on them. So um, we have to be aware that the SAP owners will be finally paid by the end users and did by this limits the size of business in the internet of things. So the main challenge to be expected is that most of the implementers of the connectivity technologies protected by SAPs are not prepared to be licensees. They have no experience in the related technology and have no experience in the licensing in the field, have no knowledge about the history and by this the value of SAPs as such. So the friend framework is basically a useful concept, but allows still too much misuse of power of SAP owners. As courts, in fact, don't really care on competition matters at the first place, regulators actually should discover the real situation and take some slight measures, having the competition and the market in mind instead of some stakeholders. Um, in fact, as experienced, uh, the parties involved in the technology being an SAP owner or being an actual implementer of the technology and not just somehow buying some parts comprising the technology are best prepared to negotiate friend rates. Unfortunately, courts too often create an unbalanced situation between the parties and by this avoid neutral negotiations. Judges, particularly in the first instance, too often put a much higher value on patent owners' right than on competition requirements and Further, courts often base the assessment on a licensing situation created on situations once uh, done by anti-competitive uh, anti conditions. So the particular need to make SAP licensing in the area of IoT better would be creating some transparency about real SAP distribution among owners. Being aware most SAP owners are NPEs in the fields they are licensing in, because very few NP, uh, SAP owners are really creating um, IoT products. Uh, the upcoming misuse of SAPs by SAP owners, particularly in the, imp uh, the impact taken into the market actually needs to be addressed by legislators and particularly regulators, as courts don't address this at first in the first instances. Uh, second instances uh, quite often will not be reached because uh, as customers are the, the um, target of the plaintiffs, um, the actual user has to finally accept the higher royalty rates even if not appropriate. Another problem is that even if SAP owners request that license fees are to be are to a certain extent challenged and are in many cases finally corrected among licensors and licensees. SAP pools are according to the European Commission not under any control with respect to the license fees they request for. As soon as they uh, have reach, reached a certain number of licensees, uh, whatever they request for is accepted as a friend, which uh, brings a certain shift to some pools which um, are now established. It, it's not true for all pools, but at least um, people should uh, distinguish between different kinds of pools and look a bit uh, more close to what really is happening in this field. So <clears throat> those set pools also should be required to use market measurements to find their friend rate right, instead of just setting it. Um, why is transparency of SEPs declarations regarding essentiality ownership and friend settings so important? Though so most of the future implementers of connectivity SEPs are SMEs that don't have a licensing or patent department. If the burden stays on the SAP implementers, then the burden is on this appropriation, uh, disproportionality on the implementers that are likely to have less resources available, which definitely will turn the royalty stacking 
for IoT implementers threatening innovation and competition and slowing down the rollout of cellular wireless and other standards in the IoT product caused by more SEP owners than ever uh, are uh, NEP, uh, NPEs and the lack of transparency in licensing offers as well as the inadequate patent pools for IoT products. That's it. In short, I tried to keep my five minutes. That's why I'm a bit, I was a bit fast. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, Georg, for for your contributions from the perspective of a, a, a very successful um, manufacturer of, of mobile phones and other, and other uh, technologies. Um, in order to start the interaction, um, thanks, uh, Steve, for your question to to Mattia and Stephanie. Um, I read this out uh, loud. What is your position on an EC-led dialogue with industry sectors on resolving generating licensing issues in light of many more potential licensees to be expected in 5G and IoT? What also Georg also just mentioned. Um, maybe you can start, Stephanie. What what would be your kind of yeah uh, wish? Well, this makes sense, and uh, or is that not? an issue the, the European Commission should, should address and then followed by, by Mathieu. Well, thanks of all to um, Steve for the question. Um, as I said in my introduction uh, statement earlier, um, we still believe that um, friend licensing is mostly about negotiations rather than disputes and litigation. So one means of negotiation could probably also be discussions held in a wider group of stakeholders with the true instant, intent to, in good faith, really arrive at a framework, maybe sector-specific, maybe industry or technology-specific, but always with the notion that an individual license case, if it's not a pool-based license, could still ask for adjusting factors. But as, as, a, as a general rule, we would not be adverse to having a, a larger discussion context, whether that would be hosted by the EU or hosted by another forum. I guess that would yet to be seen. Okay. So that's my five cents. Okay, thank you, Stephanie, for, for your answer to, to um, Steve's question. Mattia, any, any position from your side? Absolutely. Uh, Knut, uh, I have three points. Uh, uh, on, um, thank you, Steve, uh, uh, for the question. In principle, CISVEL is always willing to engage in constructive discussions. And I think so are the people that we represent. I'll make you two examples that are really important. Uh, Wi-Fi was uh, a heavily conflicted uh, technology space that was used to be considered uh, royalty-free or nearly royalty-free. There were very few royalty requests and uh, generally speaking, it was considered impossible to be licensed. There were notable failures in the market like the one of IPXI, which uh, attempted to license Wi-Fi. Siswell has been so far the only company that has been successfully licensing Wi-Fi in the context of an aggregation right, of uh, uh, license source. How did we get there? Well, we have been, of course, doing some uh, deals that were with single licensees, but eventually we figured that for that specific case, it was a good idea to actually have a discussion with an aggregator of licensees, RPX. And we thought that this discussion between an intermediary representing the implementers, RPX, and an intermediary representing the innovators, CISVEL, has been extremely constructive. Eventually, it came to uh, a deal. It's not so easy to be done, otherwise we would have been doing another deal in 2019 with them uh, on another technology and, and yet again this year, but nothing so far uh, was made public. So uh, you, you can imagine probably that was not the case. So that is one example. The case instead of DVBT2 is another case where we really engaged with the implementers in the industry uh, and we have been trying to understand what were their issues and we have been going back to, uh, to the licensors and we have been uh, offering solutions that were working, jumping, you know, in, in less than one year uh, of 60% market penetration is, is quite the achievement. So I believe that engagement is absolutely needed. I also believe that education is needed. I'll make you uh, a third example, another licensing program, our video coding licensing platform. 
on two technologies, VP9 and AV1, <coughs> were sold by those developing the technologies or claiming to have developed all the technologies as royalty free. But it so happened that we have been notified by a multitude of patent owners that they did have patents on those technologies. They asked us to form a pool. Well, you can imagine how much of a struggle it was to move from royalty free, free sold as royalty free, to royalty bearing. Whichever price you add is an infinite increment, right? So that was a real big problem. And how did we address that? Well, we did it by having a big educational program, not starting, you know, suing companies, of course, not even sending uh, notice letters to those companies, rather with an educational program. Creating even a, a video, you can find it on playtherightfuture.com, that speaks about what happened and how it is possible that a technology that was supposed to be royalty free is actually royalty bearing and so on and so forth. So all these tools, so engagement is, is so important. Um, whether the right setting is the one of the European Commission, I really, I have no clue. What I've seen working is the industry meeting, so implementers and uh, innovators that worked very well for us in several instances. Thank you, Matja, for your answer. Uh, I would like to uh, kind of uh, pose uh, the next question to Fabian. Maybe in your long list of proposals, um, maybe is there is there one proposal which which fits to Steve's uh, uh, question? Um, well, there's one. Um, Steve is probably asking about uh, discussions uh, that are more general. Um, we have no proposal on general discussions because that's always a political issue. Uh, but we have some proposals um, on on uh, uh, on, on uh, certain conflicts uh, between implementers and um, uh, and SEP holders, and that is to establish an independent expert committee um, that uh, can be uh, uh, can be asked for um, uh, an opinion uh, to set uh, uh, regarding the royalty rates and something like this. Um, and we we even uh, proposed that a court might uh, ask the parties to refer to such an independent expert committee first. Uh, before the court would have to decide uh, on uh, the French terms. Um, and uh, that is something where we say uh, such discussions should be, should be done um, uh, out of the court, yes, uh, should be done with independent experts. Um, and we kind of have an example for this, although this is really another scale, uh, in Germany with the uh, Employees Invention Act, there we have such an uh, uh, arbitration board, but we know that the, the um, uh, remuneration for employees are uh, a, a total, a completely other number than, uh, than the licensing rates. Um, but we see that there is uh, some way to, um, uh, to get uh, the uh, licensors and licensees together. Yeah, th thank you for, for, for your answer. Um, uh, regarding um, uh, the issue of, of um, regulation, um, uh, because this was a little bit mentioned by, by, by you in your statement, what uh, institutional setting or regulatory framework would you, would you like to, to see to, to establish or modify it? in order to address um, the, the problems uh, you, you raised uh, to be solved effectively. You have to unmute. Well, thank yes. Yeah, thank uh, well um, it's, it's all kind of, uh, um, uh, it's all, uh, the, 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 re the report is about all kinds of uh, 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 problems. Um, um, uh, actually, what we think is um, probably the to if if the European Union wants to um, uh, wants to change some of the rules, um, probably the European Union would have to um, uh, uh, come to a, a directive or a regulation um, okay. uh, on this. Um, but there 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 are so many different kind of problems which are 
cannot explain okay. right now. But what I, what I just missed, for instance, um, these independent expansion committee would not only be uh, um, uh, an institution that could uh, uh, help finding a rate, but it would be also an institution that could help finding the right licensing in the licensing chain, uh, in the value chain, um, uh, for, for creating a horizontal coordination or a vertical coordination, for instance. And this is, as we all know, uh, uh, a major problem that we have today. Good, thank you. For your additional comments, um, the, the the question was uh, originally addressed to Georg. Um, oh, what, what would be your your perspective? What uh, so, who could or should be done? Actually, you know, I I, I don't have. You know, the study doesn't really go in deep detail uh, with respect to what are the, the feasibility uh, uh, aspects here. So there are several options which are offered, but. Uh, so I, I, I played them through and uh, what, what you read until now, if there's no requirement uh, you, and you leave it to, to uh, someone to, to do uh, uh, something, then so reasonable parties would maybe uh, provide information, but as soon as one doesn't provide the related information, uh, all the reasonable parties would lose their power in negotiation with those other uh, SCP owners. Therefore, uh, without any uh, requirement from the European Commission, uh, I don't see a chance to have anything like a real um, transparency system coming up. I don't know which to prefer. That really depends on the feasibility requirements. So it could be done by patent office, for example, but under which conditions has to be found first. So it, it really has to be discussed also with the stakeholders, with the SAP owners. Uh, there has to be found some cost solution, which is not so easy. So I don't have a solution for this. I think many experts worked on this until now, and I don't have the final solution for it. I just mentioned that without action from the commission, nothing will move. And I think uh, I would like to emphasize here, if the commission requires something in Europe, then it's established for the world because nobody in America or in Asia can close the eyes if something in Europe has been established. Yeah, thanks. That, that's, uh, I think, an interesting uh, statement that, that uh, you might be the forerunner in setting institutional kind of frameworks, which might be then becoming blueprint for, for, for the global domain. And um, uh, therefore, I, I hand over to Steve. What, what would be kind of your perspective on, on, on this? How could be this institutional setting or regulatory framework could look like? Um, thank you, Knut. Um, just an additional comment to um, Georg's point. I think it would not only be a blueprint for, um, you know, from European to international, but also from uh, specific industry sectors, possibly um, being able to hand over to you know um, other industry sectors uh, which have no solution yet. Um, I think it might make sense really to look into these um, from uh, already mentioned by Heinz Goddard in the first panel, um, the WIPO ADR panel, which would then possibly uh, um, consist of um, you know legal, economic, technical experts who um, provide some insights are specifically independent and um, would be accepted by industry um, stakeholders um, for their assessment. And um, I think that was, this would, would help and is al already also mentioned in the ECGA decision well by ZTE in um, paragraph 68, where it says, the, for example, the amount of the royalty be determined by an independent third party. So this might definitely make sense. Um, I believe I understood that um, the WIPO is looking into this um, more specifically and will hold an event in, in January, I believe, um, possibly covering these topics, which will be definitely interesting. However, I just wanted to quickly indicate it would really make sense, I believe, if there are some templates um, created for specific sectors or the entire industry on licensing terms everyone agrees on. This would be a major step forward as there are a lot of companies in the IoT which possibly do not have the money to negotiate really um, long licensing agreements as a first step. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Steve, for, for this additional kind of link, also linking to what, what WIPO already kind of um, is doing in this context. Uh, Stephanie, um, uh, 
what would be kind of your your view from kind of the the Fraunhofer IPR perspective on on kind of institutional kind of frameworks and settings to be to be set up by the Commission? Well, with regard to ah. um, this dispute resolution, if we look into that angle, knowing that only few cases would actually end up in disputes and in litigation. Um, we believe it is really important in the light of the policy aim of transparency. I mean, transparency is really a, a, a core value that in light of policy aim of transparency and in order to ensure that there is a level playing field in terms of the rights and the obligations of the licensing parties, that the role of the courts must remain. Why am I saying that? ADR whether it is with WIPO or another institution, is number one, a voluntary element. And number two, ADR usually is confidential and happens behind closed doors, which would mean that the public, the wider public, whether industry, um, governments or society would not be taken along with the further development of law and of lawmaking around the licensing of standard essential patents under FRAND. So if we want to keep this policy aim of transparency alive, taking FRAND disputes to ADR resolution, I think is a systematic approach which is difficult so what I could rather see as an element is have independent experts from WIPO or a similar institution being available as expert witnesses in regular courts. And again, with the aim of helping the parties to arrive at a friend negotiation, but not with the aim at breaking the innovation system, which has to be built on two pillars, which is value creation and value capture. So whatever we envisage as a group of stakeholders, market participants, helping to make the digital economy um, global and successful has to be with the respect for the rights and obligations under law for each and every participant without any bias towards their business model or the IPR that they bring to the table. And that is especially relevant from a research perspective because public research organizations, RTOs, are purely about R and D and I. There is no services, there is no products, there is no alternative line of business. So it's pure R and D. And that is where the fair return on invest really matters because otherwise the funds for creating future innovation are just drying up. So that um, would be the, the research perspective. Knut, back to you. Okay, okay thank you. Um, any comments from the other panelists on, on uh, Stephanie's kind of um, intervention? May I, yes, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so. may I just come in here? Uh, so I, I, I think um, uh, Stephanie is right to each extent, actually. What we should have in mind is that SEPs in the meantime are not always used for just getting a return of investment and, and making a reasonable profit, uh, even if a reasonable uh, is one of the words in the, in the friend abbreviation. Uh, actually, a healthy R&D contract, according to my uh, uh, knowledge, and that uh, I have a lot of many years of experience, uh, creates about 85 to 90% uh, knowledge and, and know-how and about 15 to rather 10% IPR value. Uh, if you check now the R&D investment of some of the big SEP owners, uh, as far as they are public companies, you can see it. And then you check the income they have with license agreements, you see this is not a 10% issue any longer. So SEP is actually just monetization of more than just uh, getting back what is, is expected and taking this into account and having in mind that 5G will create a very big uh, uh, user field, much bigger than before. So according to my understanding, 5G licensing has to be much cheaper than all other generations before because the, the, the number of users is so much higher that uh, we will come in extreme ranges of return of investment. So uh, with several hundred percent of, of the investment, 
which according to my understanding is not any longer fair and reasonable. Thank you. Thank you, Georg, for, for making this very kind of uh, clear statement. I mean, Fabian and then Matja, yes. or? Yes, I, yes. Wanted to, I, I wanted to say something about uh, um, Stephanie's uh, um, comment that uh, ADR is intransparent and it would be better to have the experts <laughs> in, in, in a litigation. Um, oh, well, I, I think there's something in between because if you, um, of if you take normal ADR, okay, there, it might be in, uh, intransparent, of course, but there is a way of, uh, 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 of uh, arbitration where the independent expert committee um, has to give an opinion of what is the best solution for, for the conflict. And not only to render an opinion, but also to reason its opinion. And that, that's, that's why I refer to the model of the German Employees Invention Act, because that's the way they are doing it. Um, I think it is possible also um, uh, uh, in, in other fields, like, like it is possible in, in the copyright business, I, th I think it should be possible for, for the licensing of SAPs uh, that such independent experts committees render an, an opinion and give their reasons. And then if the, re the opinion is reasoned, that is then this could already be taken uh, as an expert opinion in a litigation if the parties still not do not want to agree on a license agreement. Uh, by the way, if you take a look at uh, uh, the outcome of the German employee, uh, of employees eventually, that these opinions have a, have a success of 70 to 80 percent. Uh, uh, that and that uh, being said, that the opinions are accepted by the parties. Um, okay. You were first, so please, I I yelled my. No, and I, I was not first. I just raised my hand. Please, Matthias, go ahead. Thank you. So I have two points on ADR and uh, uh, and then on on the value that is actually created by five uh, G or other competing technologies. Um, on ADR, I have to say uh, we have been incredibly adamant uh, as a patent pool and uh, as a patent owner, because we also own patents in promoting the use of ADR, both mediation as well as arbitration. And uh, unfortunately, I have to report that whilst we had some few successes in the use of mediation in the context of uh, uh, enforcement uh, in the States, by wide and large, uh, uh, we haven't been successful in, in promoting ADR as, as a true alternative. We have been super frustrated with that. We, we started, and let me be very clear, so I say it in, in a public conference here, we are willing to go for arbitration if parties want to arbitrate. We think it's a good tool, and if it can bring us together, happy to do that. But unfortunately, I have to, to report that, I mean, this voluntary uh, element has been proving mm, difficult. I'm sure we can improve the system and create uh, extra incentives, but the incentives will be very important for, uh, to, to, you know, allow people to choose that. Then on, on the value of 5G, I'm a bit confused as to who should then capture the value of uh, 5G. 5G is going to be of tremendous importance for the entire society. It will be extremely uh, it will be an industry really, or in several industries, uh, entire industries will be empowered by 5G, is going to be very important as a technology. The contributions that are given in order to create these technologies, uh, this technology are fundamental. And then who should capture really the value of that technology? The implementers? I think that even if unhealthy return on investment will be provided, we are not doing a disservice to the society because for 6G, there will be an even stronger incentive to actually contribute to the creation of an even better technology. So we need to be careful. Why are we capping what the market can bear? As long as the market can bear it, that is reasonable. I do not understand why uh, a return that is a healthy return would be seen as problematic. Now, there are going to be surely parties who are going to try to abuse this, as it has been true in the past, and I understand the comment maybe addressing those. But it's, it's very important to differentiate between those parties who are good citizens and are having a good citizenship behavior uh, from those who are actually having a negative behavior and are trying to abuse the system. Sorry, Steve. 
Okay, thank you, Matja, for your counter statement. Steve? I just wanted to quickly react uh, also to Stephanie's point and a little bit echo um, uh, Fabian's point on uh, there are indeed, I believe, possibilities of ADR being used in this uh, ecosystem. And please take into account what are the uh, alternatives. The alternatives are courts deciding on royalty rates and perhaps all the other friend conditions. And with all due respect to our judges, I believe that the courts are arguably not really the best positions and positioned institutions to, um, to determine this. Um, and there is, please take into account another point, there is also this international perspective. I think uh, one of the major advantages ADR brings into, into this um, whole discussion is you can set rates and you can do anything in friend conditions um, with, which might be acceptable to all stakeholders on an international level, on a global portfolio. And this is something I believe would also be helpful for um, all stakeholders to take into account. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Steve. Um, more. Then um, I think we uh, we are um, uh, we are more or less done um, with, with the panel. Um, what I'd like to do now is um, we have a few minutes left. That means if you'd like to have maybe some final statement about uh, what what would you see uh, the situation in 2030 and beyond. Yeah, what is kind of your, 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 your maybe your wish, but your maybe also your realistic view? What 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 do you expect uh, regarding this complex issue of SAP? Is it is it to be solved? Uh, um, oh no, there there's sorry. Before, then I take my question back. Uh, here's a question to uh, Fabian um, by uh, Barbara Yaga. She said. I believe patent pools do efficient SAP assessment out of own market interest. I believe, however, a binding SAP assessment should be left to a party who is not the patent owner itself, since binding SAP assessment by a, a, a patent owner could give too much market power to that party. Any, any statement? Yes, Talking maybe maybe she, she misunderstood the proposals I was uh, explaining to the group. Um, these um, when when the uh, see, then when the licensor have standard licensing agreements with um, uh, with uh, uh, precise royalty rates, of course this is not binding. Uh, like he can say what he wants to to have, uh, but on the other hand. If he succeeds uh, with his terms with almost all the other uh, licensees, uh, then um, one should not be astonished that uh, the court will say that um, uh, the defendant in a, a litigation will have to pay this license, uh, this royalty rate too, and accept those terms, like we have decisions uh, uh, in this way already. Um, and if she if she was mentioning uh, the um, uh, the uh, independent expert committees, of course, the independent expert committees cannot find a binding result. They shall only uh, or they only should uh, render an opinion that is reasoned. And the experience from the arbitration boards for the uh, copyright business, for instance, and also for the um, uh, uh, employees' remuneration um, is uh, that uh, these opinions, if they are well reasoned, um, are also very convincing to the parties. But they are not well, binding. Yeah, yeah. She she corrected her her question or her statement. Mm -hmm. Binding was the wrong word. I don't know, uh, Beard. Uh, do you have a, uh, an answer to her? To kind of. Yes, like? I'm. I'm still here. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, pools are, as Mattia outlined, pools are somehow in between licensees and licensors. They're, therefore, they, I think they have an own interest to render a reliable and at least more or less independent essentiality checks. But if this doesn't work, then as I said in my part of the panel, I could see a, a patent office to offer a complementary or additional service to do essentiality checks 
on a case by case basis. We must just be sure that these checks, these uh, tests are accepted by the pools and the market participants, because if you have to do another check to access the pool, then it's a waste of money and it's double, uh, double the cost and therefore acceptability is key for such uh, tests, be it from pools or be it from uh, an office. Okay, good, thank you. Um, now, now I'm coming back to my uh, concluding question. Everybody has a minute. And then we will have uh, the option of an, another, another poll, uh, three polls by brief, and then we wrap up. I don't know who wants to start. Ladies first, Stephanie. Sure. So Please. you asked, yeah, you asked for a wish or a, a perspective. Yeah. So the wish would be that the enormous funds that are presently being used to litigate standard essential patents around the globe, either from the perspective of generating excessive license fees or from the perspective of avoiding having to take a license which you were supposed to take, that they would really be freed to be used to create true innovation in the sense of innovative technology, innovative products, innovative services that serve us all, so society overall, whether it be autonomous cars or maybe even autonomous flying one day. I don't know, but that would be my wish. Definitely from a research perspective. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, so Knut, back to you. Fabian? Yeah, well, um, you were asking uh, what is the wish for 2030. Um, I think uh, the, <coughs> the interests that are at stake for all kinds of, uh, for all side, from all sides uh, are regarding the many implementers, the many uh, uh, SAP holders, and the many uh, inventions uh, that are um, uh, create uh, patents. Uh, shows that it, that it's all all is so very complex. Almost everybody has to talk with everybody else if you take a look at the licensing and the licensing chain. So my wish would be that uh, we come to structures to um, to organize uh, the the discussions, to organize the negotiations. Who shall discuss which problem with with whom with, with which uh, other person? And if we find those kind of structures, I think the, the, the big problem, what is a friend rate? What are friend terms and conditions for licensing an SAP um, uh, would, might become much easier. And this would, I think, really help uh, the innovating system like, Stephanie, uh, like Stephanie's wish uh, uh, um, expresses it. Thank you, Fabian, for, for your kind of yeah, expectation and wishes. Uh, Steve? Thank you, Knut. Um, I can just continue what uh, Fabian and uh, Stephanie have said. Um, it would be really helpful, I believe, and I wish would be that um, probably we um, welcome and accept the initiatives that come from the political level um, as opportunities and um, engage further in um, a constructive and proactive um, Dialogue. I believe really the time is running out. Um, we really have to do something in, uh, in the coming months. And um, you, as you see in the panel, we are able to constructively um, have an exchange. And um, I believe also we can find solutions on these issues. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you, Steve. Then uh, uh, Matja. Yeah, I have to say less friction is my wish for next year. Less friction also in discussions, engaging more in good faith, absolutely. And the perspective, don't behave like higher. If your license is worth about a few hundred thousand euros, don't compel both yourself and the other party, in our case, Siswell, to take four cases in front of the Federal Supreme Court in Germany and will win all of them. Because we are gonna be millions of euros into the game and that would be a huge waste. I'm pretty much echoing what Stephanie in a different way said before. This is really all money that is invested and burned into friction. It's not feeding the innovation ecosystem. Let's try to do that instead. Very good point. Thank you, Mattia. More, more funds for innovation. Last, last comment or wish by, by Georg. Thank you, Knut. Uh, Actually, according to our experience, uh, most of the uh, license negotiations, so about 98 or 99 percent are handled by negotiation. 
uh, which ends up with a court is usually uh, are usually cases with at least one party being not reasonable. Uh, and uh, already in, in the European Court of Justice decision we uh, had against ZTE, we learned actually that before someone should go to court, something between the parties should be handled. So, and, and uh, if, if one takes these uh, requirements really serious and not as it is wiped away by all people as far as I seen, have seen now, uh, it should actually turn to a reasonable result without going to court even. Uh, uh, the European Commission, uh, at the time when the Court of Justice decided uh, about our case, also had two cases in the same direction. But in the meantime, nobody cares much. So I would hope for uh, a, a situation, is it by reasonable courts in the first instance, or is it by requirements from the Commission that uh, negotiation is a requirement first and, and, and should come to a conclusion. And then the, the very few cases which still are to be uh, taken to courts don't need any arbitration because arbitration only works with, between reasonable parties. If someone is not reasonable, arbitration will not have any useful results or will be accepted by that party. So I hope for a better landscape to come to a negotiation and result situation in this field. Okay. Thank you, Georg. Um, thanks a lot for this great and very interactive panel. I think that's, uh, that was really, um, uh, was really, really cool. 